This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Gang culture has stigmatized and traumatized black and Hispanic communities for years. 80% of today's youth grew up in single parent homes. Tony lost his father to murder at the early age of 15. How did he handle the death of his father? It was tough, man. <clears throat> uh, man, ever since my father got killed by these cowards, man, I'm just like, somebody took something from me, you know? My father got killed and robbed. It hurts me every day. It made me take it out on other people, dog. When I was gangbanging, it made me more ruthless and heartless towards people. You know, it, it's like made my gangbanging career escalate. I got more ruthless, more heartless, and I was just hard on people. I was I was real hard on people, man. Cause I remember, man, I'm still hurt from that. So from the loss of my father, I don't know if, if that's the balance, that's the middle ground, I don't know, but I still hurt from my father every day. I hurt, I hurt from that loss because I could have been molded into a, a different person than I am today or, or when I was, when I was growing up, but it's reality though, it's reality now. This is my mother. Uh, I was born on my mother's birthday. All the times I went to jail throughout my lifetime for gang banging. All the juvenile halls, you know, all the homeboys I come in, when I hit juvenile hall, most of my homeboys' mothers are, uh, uh, tell them, no, you keep him there for a couple of days. But my mother never done that. She came and got me within an hour. But overall, my mother ain't never turned her back on me. Governor Jerry Brown has approved the release of nearly 1,400 so-called lifers in the last three years. Compare that to the 557 lifers who were paroled under former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Justin Brooks, a professor at California Western School of Law, is with me to talk about the releases. Justin, many of the, the, the criminals who are going free are murderers. How does the system determine whether this person is still a threat to society? Well, it, it's very difficult to get paroled no matter what in this state. So I think this is a, a really good thing. Being arrested, falsely accused, and convicted is a traumatic experience. I'm still upset, you know, by me being uh, framed, having my freedom uh, taken away from me for 33 years, separated from my mother, my brothers, and my daughters, you know. But it changed me, though. You know, I look at it as if I got away with so much when I was in, when I was gang banging. But so I look at it as as if my past finally caught up with my present, and basically God parked me, parked me for uh, 33 years. You know, doing those 33 years was uh, uh, all about survival. It was all about survival. It was, it was a mind blowing experience. I was facing the death penalty at the time too. So they decided, I guess they was being polite about it, they decided not to give me the death penalty, give me life without, which is basically equivalent to the death penalty. Life without possibility of parole, man, you never get out of prison, you're gonna die in prison. And that's what they sent me to. I posed to give me, put me on death row, give me a death sentence, they gave me life without. What were some of the things that you did when you first got to prison, what happened? Well, you know, I was I was a full full flash gang member at the time. You know, uh, as soon as I got there, I joined one of the, uh, the Crips uh, prison organizations. Uh, when I first came in the prison system, so they sent me they sent me to Palm Hall, which is Chino. They locked me up. First time in prison, I posted went to the main line. They locked me up because they already got me stigmatized and labeled as a shot caller from the streets, and they didn't post to do that. <laughs> uh, Double jeopardy again, so they locked me up. So when I get to San Quentin 90 days later, uh, I joined one of the Crips organizations up in there. And uh, and my 
it's different in prison, Mike. It's like you had to renew your whole reputation. With everything you've done on the streets, you got to start over again in the, you know, in the system. Nobody don't care what you've done on the streets. You was this hardcore killer. You shot 10 dudes with one bullet and all that crap. They weren't, it was all about knife play. Now, you ain't got no gun no more. It's all about using knives and stuff. So I had to start all over. And, but my, my, my game banging escalated about five times even more. Anyway, 1989, I, I decided to uh, make my exit out of the gang, per se. You know, that's easy said and done. I got convicted in 83, and I really started smashing it and getting focused and fight for my, uh, on my appeal in 1989, six years after I got convicted. Yeah. Both of these, this is my first appeal in the LA Times newspaper right here. This is my second one. This first one I went through in uh, 1999, only thing the judge was gonna do was drop my life without down to 25 to life. And me and my lawyer appealed this one, and we weren't satisfied with that. So we fought, and so in uh, 2002, a couple years later, that's when I got my freedom. That's when I got my freedom, right here. So both of these were in the LA Times. And, uh, and then, before I saw the LA Times, we was on lockdown in Salinas Valley. And so they, they my lawyers, no call and say, damn, I wanted to talk to me, right? I didn't even know I won my case. I'm telling you, man, nobody don't want to go through what I went through, man, I'm telling you. But anyway, I was on lockdown, Salinas State, Salinas Valley State Prison. So I had to get on the phone with handcuffs on me because we was on lockdown. It was due to a racial war or something happened. I got on the farm and my lawyer just told me they won my case. I'm coming home. I was in uh, 2002, man. I was just... In all two, them years out of my life, man. In 2002? Yeah. So how long did it take you to actually get on the streets? Well, I didn't get on the streets until two years ago. April the 5th, 2014. So it took you almost 12 years to get out of prison after they overturned your conviction. Well, that's because I had to I was still forced to take a deal. You know, I never gave up, but I never knew when I was going to see those streets again. It's, it's an indescribable feeling to come from prison after 33 years, from facing the death penalty, doing a uh, half of a life without sentence, and, and coming home. It's, it's indescribable when you walk through them gates like that. Yeah. And I've been home a little over two years. But well, this month made it uh, two years I've been home. But my first year was the most roughest year, and it's, and it's still hard. So you, you, you speak of your wife. Um, what's her name and how long has she, you, you guys been married? Well, my wife is named Cheryl Stacy. This is my fourth wife. Uh, we've been uh, we've been uh, together ten years and married over eight years now. Okay. And she's my queen, been in my corner one thousand percent. Like I said, she's my fourth wife, and I hope she's my last wife. All right. So, how many children do you have? Talk about them. Well, I have three. I have three daughters. I have three daughters. Uh, Names. Uh, my three daughters' name is the oldest one. <laughs> Her name is Shanika, and uh, the the second one name is Tonisha, named after me. Then my baby girl Shanae, and it's just uh, she been down 15 years. She doing 40 to life in prison right now. She been in child killing women's prison for uh, almost 15 years now. For what? Murder. Okay. Uh, talk about your grandkids. But, and I didn't want to end it on that note about my youngest daughter being in prison for just murder because the reason is she killed this dude because this dude socked in her eye and tried to rape her. And she came back two days later and shot him all nine times. So that's what led up to that. My name is Ben Owens. Uh, everybody calls me Taco. That's a childhood nickname that I go by. Um, we're at a, a place called Detours Mention Group. This is a place where we service uh, people who want to make transitions in their lives. They want to uh, believe again, yes, jobs uh, are necessary, but at the same time, so is the education. It, there's, it's not just a matter of somebody having a job and still living in you know, uh, a community that's full of poverty because that person could potentially become a victim. So now I went and got my forklifting license and all that stuff. I done, I done passed all that, my hazmat. 
uh, tests and all that stuff. But anyway, I searched for so many jobs, so many jobs, went online, offline, everywhere. They would never call me back, never call me back to this very day. It's rough because you got to pay bills. That stuff is real. That's reality. That's, you would be sh uh, pushing a shopping cart out here if you do not have no job or, or some type of income coming in. So, and it's still rough on me right now, me and my wife right now. So that's why I'm trying to do the best I can. Uh, we're trying to establish multiple streams of income. We're trying to get, get our nonprofit organization off the ground right now. I'm trying to get my books out there and, and, do, and start this other business right now. But it's, sometimes it takes money to make money, so I'm going through that process right now.